I took losing as learning. I take failure as feedback. And that is a mindset, whether you are CPA on Wall Street, a fireman or a teacher, if you're able to lose and continue to progress, you are always going to succeed. Welcome to The Fi Show, where you'll get a behind-the-scenes look into financial independence. Here's your host, Cody and Justin. Welcome back, everybody, to another episode of The Fi Show. Before we get to talking too much, let's check in with the co-host, Cody. What's going on, man? Hey, what's going on, Justin? So, again, didn't have too much going on this past weekend like the previous six weekends since we've been in this coronavirus lockdown. But something I haven't been mentioning is every single weekend, my friends and I, my roommates and I, have been going to a different fast food chain every Saturday, and then we get back, we think about it for a long time, we give it a power ranking. So this past week, we went to Shake Shack. It got a weighted average of 7.5. It was absolutely delicious. But how about you, man? <laughs> I love that. They have a very good chicken sandwich. And I agree, you have to find these like weird, interesting ways to keep things like kind of spiced up and interesting. So this weekend, we went to like Total Wine. We take turns every weekend kind of doing a date night where the other person, you know, really takes charge and kind of surprise the other one. And so I was just told, hey, pick out a couple craft beers that sound interesting. And then Leslie kind of made it like a mock brewery set up at a local park that had a view of the city. And we kind of act like we were just kind of outside in the beer garden like we would be if it wasn't Corona time. So... And speaking of beer, we also had a cool little frugal win where I got a six pack of Coors Light for free. They had some kind of Twitter thing going on. You know, it feels like one of those where there's no way this is actually going to work. And sure enough, two days later, I got a PayPal receipt where they paid me back for a six pack. So that was pretty cool. But enough about us. Let's take a moment for our partner. Keeping track of your net worth is one of the most important things you can do on your journey to financial independence. If you don't have an idea of what your net worth is, there's no way that you can keep your quote unquote score. One of our favorite tools to keep this score is called Personal Capital. If you haven't already started using it, it's an online software that basically compiles all of your data, it crunches all your assets, all your liabilities, and spits out a net worth number and allows you to track it day by day, month by month. Yeah, Cody, one of the big things that hold people back when they're doing activities like tracking their expenses or tracking their net worth is just they look at it as a big burden. And this allows you to go in with one username and one password and access as many financial accounts as you have. These can be loans, these can be 401ks, these can be HSAs, bank accounts, credit cards. They're all linked there. The other thing I really like about personal capital is it's very investing focused. So you can go in there and look at your allocation across your entire portfolio. So you don't just look at your allocation in one type of account, but your allocation as a person completely. And if you want to use the same tool that me and Cody use to track our net worth, which is completely free, you can do so at thefyshow.com slash PC. That's thefyshow.com slash PC. All right, now back to the episode, and we have a super exciting episode today. So we have Jed Collins, who is former All-Pro 2011 best fullback in the National Football League in the NFL He's played for the Saints, the Bears, the Chiefs, the Cardinals, the Browns, the Titans, and spent nearly a decade in the NFL. Super pumped to have this guy on and talk about what it means to be an all-star, someone who you get out of college or a little bit after college and you're making more money than you can possibly fathom. He talks about what's wrong with how they're teaching new players in the game, how to handle their money, all the pressures of living that lavish sports lifestyle and everything in between. Love this guy's mindset. It was an absolutely jam-packed episode filled with awesome information on how you can level up your mindset and how you can take control of your money vehicle. But I'm not going to take away all of his shine. Take it away, Jed. Working year in the NFL, I got my first you know, relatively big check. Big check for me being an undrafted guy. And in the NFL, you take your contract, whether it's $100,000 or $10 million, you just divide it by 17 and you get big weekly checks. And I, I received my first one and I remember looking at it in an envelope on the table and knowing I had spent every dollar of that check before I even opened it up. Now, full disclosure, I bought an engagement ring and my wife and I are still married, so it's cute, but I will tell her to this day, that was a very poor financial decision. I remember two nights after that, waking up in sweats and knots and just being really anxious about this idea and concept of money. I was a fullback. Again, I was a no-name player. I knew the damage and physical toll. If I didn't start to do things differently, I wasn't going to have captured, quote-unquote, the dream. 
And the dream is walking out of the NFL with something to show for it. So that one check really opened my eyes to the humbling reality. I knew nothing about money. I was a spender. You know, my father and my my mother were great parents, but knew they know and knew nothing about money. So it was up to me to go check out Barnes and Noble and kind of just figure it out on my own. Well, as you're leading up to you know, that draft process and everything, because you did come in as an undrafted free agent, there had to be a moment where, or a period of time where you weren't sure that that was going to happen, that dream was going to be realized, that you were going to be getting those 17 checks. So I'm kind of curious, like, what were you thinking going into that? Like, what was your backup plan if the NFL didn't work out and you didn't have something to kind of start off and get, you know, get you a leg up on life there? That's what's so interesting is of the locker room, I was an accounting major. I went, I studied to get my GMAT. I was going to go and become a CPA. I had a quote unquote backup plan, which different topic is kind of a negative in the NFL world coaches and nobody wants you to have that backup plan. But that's when I realized, you know, me being a business degree an accounting major, having brothers who are very highly educated, you know, this was not a Jed missed this class and didn't study kind of thing. This was just a systemic problem and void. I knew as a guy who understood, you know, financial statements because it was XYZ company making widgets that I should have a better understanding of, you know, the Johnson family making 75 grand, but nobody had presented that to me. So looking around the locker room in particular, I knew nobody else had those answers, including myself. So building up to the process of potentially going into the NFL, I can imagine it's such a nerve wracking and life changing moment for so many of those players. Was there any kind of financial program, a mentor, a person that could say like, hey, you're going to be getting these really sizable checks that you've never seen in your entire life before. And these are the things you should do. And these are the things you shouldn't do. You know, I think for the first and second, like the big name dudes, yes, they need to go get an advisor right away. And I think the responsibility gets shifted off of them to some degree. Having talked to enough first round guys after the fact, that's kind of how it happens. For the vast majority is you don't have the money and everybody kind of just tells you, well, focus on making it first. You know, you you don't have to worry about handling it until you get it. And it's like, well, that's too late. But by the time I get my first paycheck, it's a little after the fact to be preparing for what to do with it. So the NFL is trying they are starting to institute, you know, more rookie classes and courses. But again, that's after you've made it and started to receive checks. Me particularly, I've started to go to a couple pre-draft combine training atmospheres and do some workshops with them because, I, you know, I, I'm a big believer that it's not the lack of knowledge. It's just the lack of education. Nobody has shown people or guys or, or the 22-year-old not going into the NFL how to manage their first paycheck. That's really what I, my passion is and where I'm headed is developing those courses, being that trusted person that I don't want to sell you anything. I just want to show you how this language you've never been taught works. As you're kind of getting into the NFL and you're starting, that's starting to become part of your normal life and you're starting to be surrounded by people who I assume a lot of them aren't making wise financial decisions based on a lot of the documentaries and things I've seen. Please correct me if I'm wrong, but if you're in that in kind of environment, Like, how tough is that? Even if you do get the education and you start realizing what you should be doing, are there a ton of like peer pressures that are pushing you down the road of of wasting all your money? All the time. And that's every environment. Peer pressure is a beast. People highlight the silly stories and the crazy jewelry and the, you know, the stuff like that. But there's also a lot of guys I talk to who are supporting, you know, an entire family who have 10, 20, 30 relatives back in Haiti who are taking their paychecks, you know, and you look at it. And I I remember talking to one rookie who spent $50,000 on Christmas for his family because he was the first generation to go to college, first generation in America, you know, and that nobody in his family had ever celebrated or enjoyed Christmas. And then he looked at his account and realized he only had about twelve, thirteen thousand dollars to survive all off season. And so you look at these decisions and you're you're like, well, one, that was a beautiful story, very heartfelt, but he just had no idea around the bigger picture, the annual expenditures of, of how to handle money. And so the peer pressure aspect is definitely real. You go from anything, you know, rookie dinner 
is a staple of the NFL, and I think they've changed a lot of it. And as I was in it, we've started to and change more and more because there would be guys who would walk out of their rookie dinner having spent $27,000. And that's just an insane amount of money to spend on a meal for a bunch of guys who don't need you to buy their dinner in the first place. (laughs) And then it's the tit-for-tat kind of thought process Definitely competition in the wallet perspective and in what you drive and what you wear, which is really hard for, again, a 22-year-old to sit next to a 32-year-old and try to compete when that guy's on his third contract. Jed, I'd love if we could kind of dig into the money piece here. I know you're saying, oh, I wasn't a first-round draft pick, but you were one heck of a player, man. You were an absolute all-star. So how big were these contracts that you were signing exactly? Yeah, I I like to be self-deprecating. I was <laughs> voted the number one fullback in the game in 2011, making me the best in the world. So I earned it. I actually do a, a series called Rookie to Veteran around the behaviors I stole from guys in the locker room that led me on the path to success. I look at money differently now, and and you have to learn how to see money differently. So next year, the rookie minimum is going to bounce up towards, I think, $550,000 or $600,000, which is an incredible amount of money for a 22-year-old. I've actually written into the New York Times because each year they say, so-and-so, Bob Joe, just signed a a $32 million contract as the number one overall pick. And I say, you are perpetuating the problem. He didn't sign a $32 million contract. He signed a $20 million contract, which is still an amazing amount of money. But if Joe Bob goes and spends on $32 million, he's not only broke, he's in debt. And so if you, as the educator and the media, are not perpetuating exactly how money works, how do you expect him to understand it differently? I also look at it and say, let's say $500,000. You're an undrafted guy. You make it three years, which is the average. That's one and a half million. That's a sizable chunk of change by the time you're 25. Again, cut it in half, so you have 750. You also are living the NFL lifestyle, so let's call that $100,000 a year, so you're at 450. You have, you know, maybe you want to buy a car, you want to do some things, blah blah blah. Maybe buy a house. You're very quickly at $200,000, and again, at 25 years old, you save 200,000. This dream was supposed to set you up for life not get you to 27. And so if you look at it and you make it three years, you retire and you got $200,000 sitting in the bank, you have two years to go get a job before you're broke. And that transition is another beast and another element because so many guys have such a tough pill to swallow of your first job paid you a million dollars. It's really humbling to go to work for maybe longer hours for $62,000. Like that's a that's part of the ego and the transition. But like in my career, I, you know, seven years, I was on practice squad. I got some signing bonuses and player performance. I ended up with a career earnings of about 3 million. You take out taxes and yada, yada. I always looked at football. My NFL dream was going to be one of the fortunate ones nowadays to get a pension. So my retirement, my freedom was going to be impacted And I wanted to get a home that I probably wouldn't have been able to get as a normal, traditional 25, 7, 8-year-old. And both of those were my dream. Both of those I got to walk away having accumulated and achieved financially and then bought the home that is right now, location, location, location is proving ever more present. And so I'm very happy about those two things. But those were absolutely based on educating myself and going to getting my CFP each off season, learning the tax system, learning insurance, learning estate, all those kinds of elements. So you just mentioned a pension system, which is something a lot of people don't see anymore. You know, it's reserved for things like maybe postal workers, government workers, you know, the military, but the NFL has one. Can you walk us through? Because it's obviously not a 20 year requirement, like a lot of government jobs, because that would be insane. <laughs> so what are the requirements that lead to a pension in the NFL? And is it just a flat, like once you get it, you get this certain percentage or how does it work? So I love that comment. Actually, chapter one of my book, Your Money Vehicles, around this idea of pension systems going extinct and why everyone has to sit in the driver's seat of their own money vehicle today. Pensions being lifetime income sources and streams from companies, they wanted to shift the liability off of their balance sheet onto the individual. I tell a little story about trains and cars, but 
the pension system bases on the league average. The league average is three years. So if you make it three years, you get pensioned. And right now, just for round numbers, it's about $500 a season per month. So if you make it three years, you get about $1,500 a month. But that does not kick in until you're age 55. So most guys retire at 25. you got to survive 30 years before that kicks in. And then what is $1,500 going to be in 30 years? It's a great benefit. It, it, we are very fortunate to have one. But nobody else, you know, it's, it's ironic because the guys who could retire on their pension at 55 don't need it. It's the guy, those guys have played, you know, 10, 12, 18 years, and hopefully they're not banking on their pensions. But it is a, a fortunate blessing to have one. It will be a tremendous benefit. But just like Social Security, it is not something that I am banking heavily on in my financial plan as an individual. And it's not something that as I talk to any young athletes, I tell them to focus on. It's it's one of those elements that is a perk. It is not a big piece of the plan. And yeah, if you want to be a police officer, a fireman, a professor at a university, those are some of the pension systems left. But over 90 percent have gone extinct based on crisis and events like the coronavirus because if you talk to anybody over 55 who is receiving their pension, NFL or whoever, they are very happy they have a pension right now because their 401k was non-existent and non-effective. So shifting gears a little bit, I think this is going to be a really interesting question. So you talked about your career earnings, $3 million. So far, they all have. <laughs> <laughs> so... As a professional athlete, I mean, you need insane levels of dedication, motivation. You're playing one of the most physically demanding positions in football. Basically, your job is to run through as many grown men who are lifting weights for five hours a day as you possibly can. That's just nuts, and you need a crazy amount of dedication. As someone with that kind of mentality who can achieve these things that most quote-unquote normal people probably can't achieve just because they give up or they're not chasing the dream and they don't have that mindset... What kind of things from a mental perspective do you think you have or maybe don't have versus someone who, say, earned $3 million in some Wall Street job? And OK, let's assume that they're not in finance. They, they're they like an inventor or something. Do you think you have a skill set that better equipped you to kind of handle the money vehicle and put you in the driver's seat? Or do you think you are less equipped than someone in that other scenario who maybe invented the next awesome app? I will go with the mindset around how you achieve success. And this translates to financial, it translates to football, it translates to Wall Street and everything. The characters and the people you suggested are inventors, professional athletes. The mindset you have to have is exactly what allows you to survive is you are not defeated by failure. No inventor ever hit it out of the park on their first invention. I believe Thomas Edison said, you know, he didn't fail 10,000 times. He just found 10,000 things that didn't work. And that is a mindset. Me particularly, I got cut 13 times. You know, I, I stand in front of you about to be rookies or second or third year players. And they're like, all right, who's this dude coming to talk to me about money? And my first question is, how many times do you think I was cut? And, you know, four, five, whatever. And I say 13. And immediately everybody has a little bit different level of respect. Because I got up 13 times. I, I continued to chase. I continued to get better. And that is the mindset I would challenge people to have. I don't fear failure. I welcome failure. I think failure is one of the most misunderstood aspects of our world today. It's this idea of everybody gets a trophy. No, people don't deserve or need a trophy. People un need to understand that losing is okay. Losing's fine. How I learned this was growing up, I have two older brothers, one a year and another two years older than me, and my dad would have us play a game called King for a Day. And we'd go in the backyard and play one-on-one -on -one basketball, and the winner was King for the Day, getting to boss the other two brothers around. You know, hey, go take out the trash, go get me a drink of water, kind of all these things. And I remember very vividly of the hundreds, thousand times we played, I won twice. Twice out of however many times we played. And what I realized was that gave me a skill that I would always achieve more athletically than both of my brothers because they took losing hard. 
I took losing as learning. I take failure as feedback. And that is a mindset, whether you are CPA on Wall Street, a fireman or a teacher, if you're able to lose and continue to progress, you are always going to succeed because you won't give up. If anybody needs to hear a message right now during the coronavirus, it's this kick in the pants is not the end. It is an opportunity for you to reevaluate your skill set, take this loss, take this failure, take whatever you're defining it as, pivot and continue to grow. As human beings, as businesses, you grow or you die. And I think if you can develop the mindset that losing is not dying, you welcome it and you can stare failure in the face and smile, you will be shocked at what opportunities will come your way. So I kind of want to continue with that discussion around some of those mental things you got to pick up in the NFL because, you know, while we started off kind of focusing on the negative part and some of the bad aspects that you could pick up in that locker room, I know that you got to spend some time in just an offensive machine with, you know, Sean Payton and Drew Brees and you were on the offensive side of the ball. So I'm just curious, like, you know, I think about being in a, a corporate job like I'm in. And one of the things I love is getting to interact with, you know, CEOs and different things of companies, these really smart people and just get to pick their brain and learn from them. Like what kind of things did you get to pick up from these minds like Sean Payton and Drew Brees? I love that. What's even cooler in my eyes is today I get to sit down and interview those CEOs, those presidents, those entrepreneurs, because I played in the NFL, you know, it has that kind of just funny little opening of doors. And so now I geek out on them and they geek out on the fact I get to tell them a story about Drew Brees. So here's my story about Drew Brees. <laughs> <laughs> so the two things about there's 10 principles in Rookie to Veteran, but two of them that I really associate very closely with financial success and just success in general. One is I learned watching and witnessing Drew and he was, I played 20 years of football, high, high level of football. And he was the first and only quarterback I ever saw do this. It didn't matter if we were doing a walkthrough, a seven on seven, a team drill, pregame, during the game, every rep he took, he would throw the ball to his first read and then his hands, his eyes, and his feet would go to his second, his third, his fourth, and down to his check down. That process, that routine continued hundreds and thousands of times throughout every practice I was with him in, and I played with him for four years. That idea taught me about repetition and about routine. I actually started asking him because I'm a curious cat and, you know, you sit next to a guy long enough, you, you feel comfortable to ask questions. I was like, man, I don't even get it. Well, why? Like 20 years of football, you're the only guy I've ever seen do that. And it kind of speaks to his success. But he said, hey, listen, in the game, during the moment, I don't want to be thinking about where my feet are supposed to go or where my hands or my eyes are. I want that to be built in. I want that to be a habit. I want to function without thinking because I want to focus on the reward. The reward for me is the first down, the score. If I know my body can function without me thinking about it, I can be more present. I can interpret and read and react to the defense. And that freaking blew my mind, man. Like I just, you get to be around greatness and you get to taste what that looks like. And it is just one of the neatest feelings you will ever get to experience is being around people like that. I will say that guy is is twice the man. He is a football player and 10 times the leader. He quotes and, and embodies books on end. And, you know, you flip open his locker room door and it's like the pyramid from John Wooden. And you're like, wow, this guy's special. And so I look at routines based on money. I had to build a new routine when I would get a paycheck. I have a money bucket system that we touch on in your money vehicle, but it is this process around, I need to already have made the choices and built out my routine based on the rewards I want, because that's what a habit is. And so if I can build a habit of my money buckets, then I can receive a paycheck and know I'm going to capitalize on it. The other mindset I really stole from witnessing veterans is the biggest difference between the college game and the NFL game was an inch and that mindset is so powerful you can do that in absolutely anything corporate job whatever it is and i witnessed this because i worked out with a 15-year linebacker in kansas city and we would go out run 40 yards he'd run 45 we'd run 50 he'd run 55 we'd do a set of 10 he'd slide on a two and a half and do a set of 11 
And it was just to dig at us and piss us off. But eventually, I again, I asked, I said, well, you know, I don't get it. Five pounds on bench press. It's like, what are you proving? And he's like, listen, I'm 15 years in. I started out shorter and slower than everybody else. And now people are younger, healthier and cheaper than me. The only way I cut I get to win is coming here and stealing an inch every day. And that's how he approached everything he did, whether it was film, practice, weights, everything, food, everything was an inch to him. And I adopted that mindset. And when I got to New Orleans, my objective was Monday through Saturday, I would steal an inch a day. And that would be six inches throughout the week. So on Sunday in football, there's something called the six inch battle. You mentioned I went and ran. I, I didn't run through people. I had to move people. Um, <laughs> that was that was my job. But at the NFL level, they measure it in six inches. If your collision, you can move your opponent back six inches, you won that rep. And that is how my mindset changed and where I truly began to own the position, the role, and my identity was stealing an inch a day and going to win in that six-inch battle on Sundays. Oh, dude, I'm so glad we went in this direction. I feel like we're hitting on so many important things and so many <laughs> awesome lessons and so kind of going and digging a little bit deeper into routines, and hopefully we can tie some of these concepts you talk about, like money buckets in. Obviously, as someone who is so dedicated to routines, you have to have a diet, a workout plan. You're practicing for hours and hours a day. You have to be in the right mental state of mind to go and get on the field on Sunday. How has those routines, or I guess the building of those routines, worked into now your entrepreneurial life, where you're a producer, you're making mm -hmm. content, you're speaking all this awesome stuff, because we want to kind of capture some of that for our audience. We like to be as tactical as possible. And then maybe you can tie the narrative of the money buckets and how you can use these same routines, these same things that you're doing day in and day out or month in, month out, week in, week out, whatever that might be, to kind of take a hold of your financial picture as well. It's so humbling. I started my business, you know, I've been doing it as a side hustle for two or three years. I started it full time in January. Not the best time to launch a public speaking business, I'll tell you that. But I'm pivoting. I'm figuring it out as, you know, again, you, you die or you grow. I have over the last six months being an entrepreneur been putting myself through the rookie to veteran process where you as an entrepreneur, you wake up and you have a thousand things to do. How do you prioritize? How do you find what's most important? How do you strategize? How do you work on the business and in the business? All of these elements are, have been really neat to be able to take away and build out and then implement into the business I've started, I would say the definition of strategy and one of the big things I took away from football and it's helping me right now is not playing checkers and playing chess. And I'm going to tie this into money here in a second, but checkers and chess are played on the same board. And as you look at that board, you realize checkers, the objective is each piece is the same, just get to the other side. Chess each piece has a unique approach, a unique attack, a unique advantage. And you don't just get to another side. You actually have to define what a checkmate is and then go and achieve that. Success is a funny thing. You cannot achieve it until you define it. And those are the elements that I really look at my business and I say, okay, if I'm set on my routines, that is a day-to-day -day interaction. That is what is going to help me. But now I got to go play chess and I got to plan a couple moves in, in advance. Well, then I need to also define what winning is, and that's my most. And so it's a continual building of a sequence. Now, how I look at that in the financial realm, your most is whatever is your financial objective or primary role right now. I don't like retirement. I think retirement is gone. It went out with pensions because you don't work till 65 and walk away with an income. We aim for freedom. So I don't want your goal to be freedom. I want you to set a particular goal that you can accomplish in a week, a month, a year around money. Then how do we build out our trust strategy? Well, we start to look at what our decisions are going to be. How are we planning out the next two, six months, a year? Where is our corona cushion? Where are these elements in our business and in our personal lives? I am shocked at how many companies, small companies, have gone out of business in a month's time. It's like, hey. We heard these stories of, you know, half of America can't handle a $400 emergency that I understood a little bit better. But businesses were functioning on a paycheck to paycheck process as well. That's even more scary. So when we look at the money buckets, that is part of the routine element. Money bucket says, 
I don't care if you're starting at Amazon tomorrow or you're Jeff Bezos, you have five decisions with every job or every paycheck you get. Every dollar you make has five associations with it. Society, which is taxes, it's just real. I mean, you're going to pay taxes. How much you pay is absolutely a choice. So you need to better understand that 90% of the tax code is built around how to reduce and lower your tax bill. The second choice is going to be around your past decisions. Anything due before the first of the month, rent, bills, anything that you already know come the first of the month is going to go out the door. Third bucket is your present day choices. That's a daily interactions. Fourth is your future choice. How are you going to make a dollar and save a dime? I love that quote. 10% goes to my future. And the last, perhaps the most important, because science is telling us this is really the happy bucket, is the compassion choice. Who, where, or what do I want to give to because I've gone out and worked really hard for my money, but I also want to impact and give it and be compassionate to others? That simple five question sequence, and I would not prioritize them that way. If you want to figure out how to prioritize them correct way, go grab your money vehicle. But if you are able to set up and automate a system between those five decisions, you will not only achieve all the goals you want, you'll also get to spend your money guilt free and enjoy it because you've checked off the other boxes. So often we get to the end of the month and feel guilty because we're not going to get to save for our future or pay compassion or even pay taxes. And if you are able to systematically build out a routine and lead to a habit, that's how you're going to achieve financial success. I love a lot of those like analogies that you're putting in there and this idea of segmenting things around. And there's obviously like a ton of preparation in there as far as like mentally you have to think about what is it that you want to do going down the road? What is it that you will feel comfortable with, with the money that you're going to have left over? You know, these goals that you want to have, like you said, you got to define it before you can achieve it. And going down that road with preparation, I just keep thinking about you were on these practice squads a lot of time. And then all of a sudden, you know, you have Heath Evans retires, who is a great fullback himself. And then you get this opportunity to come up and to be that starter and to really kind of take hold of that position I'm sure a lot of people find themselves in that situation in a different format, right? Like they're at work and somebody else is leading the team and all of a sudden they decide to retire or they get sick or they're not there for that day. And you got to step up and give that presentation. What are some things that you learned in those moments that you think people could, that you could share with people who are maybe they're not in the leading role, but they need to always be preparing for that opportunity to really shine because it could mean a promotion. It could mean you know, that they get to excel in their own career. It may not be a football field, but we all have, you know, something we're trying to navigate where we may get that opportunity and we have to prepare even when we don't know when that day's coming. And it's just the development of your skill set, your, you know, your work belt. Look at what you both are doing right now. This is not something, you know, you just happened into. This was, you were playing chess. This was strategic. You understood you wanted to get a message out. You wanted to build a community and you wanted to better yourselves. So in football, it's always called next man up. Somebody gets hurt, next man up. And I don't care if it's Tom Brady or Judd Collins. You know, if somebody goes down, opportunity is behind that door. So that is what is a really interesting element is careers are made based on who is ready and prepared for that situation. In the corporate world, you know, it's, it's simple concepts like dress for the job you want, not the job you have. But I look at today, I look at the global climate, somebody telling me, You can't leave your home for 30, 60, however many days. A lot of people take this time and say, all right, well, let's go check out Tiger King and Netflix, this beast. And what you really have to force yourself to do is start to say, "Okay, I understand that this thing is happening to me. I don't control that. What do I control? I control my focus. I control my attitude and I control my preparation. So what can I be preparing today That is going to better me for this future world. This this crisis is going to change our world. It's going to change industries. What skill set can I start to develop today to prepare me for that? So, you know, the, the injury happened. It is next man up. Millions of people have just lost their jobs. That is a tragedy. That is hard. But it is this moment that all of those people have to look in the mirror and say, okay, What industries, what companies are hiring? What skills, what jobs do I need? So I look at this opportunity and say, hey, I know this is hard. I lost all of my income for the next foreseeable future because public speaking, 
I don't know when people are going to get together and do that again. <laughs> but you pivot. You look at, all right, here is an element. I've learned. I've started a podcast. Here's an element. I'm going to do virtual sessions. Here's an element. I wrote a book. I'm writing another book. You know, and it's not just creative lessons. It's also, okay, I was a waiter. Now where are people? Well, people are asking others to go and do their grocery shopping or deliver food. Or how do I pivot and be prepared for whatever is to come? You cannot predict crisis. You cannot predict market drops. But you can build plans and planning helps you prepare for them. Oh, I love that because something that I always think about is like skills are the most valuable currency you can possibly have. Like if everyone tomorrow, if money stopped working, no one exchanged a dollar for a service, whoever the most skilled men or women or skilled men or women, those are the people that are going to be in demand. Those are the people who are going to be winning in a society. So I love that you said that. And something I kind of want to dive into here, and I definitely want to get into the origin story of you becoming like a personal finance educator too, but something I was reading a, a previous interview you were doing, and you prided yourself on being a good storyteller. And let's pretend I'm a 22-year-old, I'm just about to enter the NFL, I'm number one draft pick, whatever. I'm just going to have so much money coming toward me. And I can imagine kind of going back to what you're saying before, you want to know you made it and you want to have the fancy car and the house and all that good stuff. What's the like the language that you're using with these players to convince them that, hey, maybe this isn't the right way? Like, can you kind of just walk us through on a very tactical level, like the language you're using, kind of maybe some of the framework, some of the analogies that you're able to shift their mindset about money with in such a short amount of time? If you have this, you know, one session you're talking to them for. There's a little bit of shock and awe, you know, scared straight to some degree of I play through a very quick idea around how long a million dollars will actually last. I also love to show, you know, what $200,000 can turn into over 30, 40 years to be able to show you both sides of the coin. The one thing you control is your expense, your burn rate. And so it's not so much how much can I teach guys in a short amount of time. It's can I make sure you're going to go do two things? That is how my focus and my mindset has shifted. I am not a presenter. I'm simply a facilitator. And I don't educate. Education in and of itself fails. I empower. I give you the confidence to go and act. And so one of the things, you know, I, I try to challenge guys to do is define their burn rate and set a goal for each year of how much they want to save. Those are elements and items that they control. They're intertwined as well. So it's an easy kind of first time. But if I don't ever speak to you again, I have, you know, another eight action steps for every rookie to take. But if you just do those two things, you're headed in the right direction. And so anybody who is trying to get into speaking, communication, education, teaching, which is another skill and something that I think more and more people need to is stop trying to impress people. Stop trying to show everybody all you know in one session. Focus each session on each person in the audience getting one thing. If you can get one thing, it's that inch mindset and mentality that was a successful endeavor and that was worthy of people's time. I also play through very quickly in one of the best sayings in pro sports is simply be a pro. It is summation of excuses. It is a reasoning. It is everything. Your coach will tell you, your teammates will tell you, your mirror will tell you there are no excuses. Just simply be a pro. And that is having the confidence, not the cockiness, the internal messaging to be able to do things building trust amongst your teammates, amongst your coaches, your organization, and yourself. And then the most important is pros always add value. So finding things that you're going to put your name on and know it is going to improve and not take away from. And I have stories and elements to each of those steps, but that typically the understanding of what the pro mindset is, it really rookies as big of an ego as they are, they also are hungry to find success. And so anybody who will give them breadcrumbs down that trail, they're willing to listen if they trust you. And as Cody mentioned, we definitely want to get into that transition period, like how you got from being the player to being in the position now to where you're going in and you're teaching these new players. And I'm curious, like, a, how did that transition happen? And B, like, did you have some opportunities while you were still a player to get to hone this message, practice it on some players, see what did and didn't resonate? So it began out of fear. Like I mentioned, my first paycheck going away. I went and got rich dad, poor dad, as millions of people have. Then I got introduced to Susie Orman and Kramer and, you know, Warren Buffett books and things like that. And it began to be a mission of mine to change my personal journey. 
You mentioned talking to guys in the locker room. That's where my passion began. When I was able to educate and empower, you know, young players on the benefits on how to help their family while also prioritizing themselves, while I was able to explain through simple digestible stories, the things around money that were going to change their life, I fell in love with that. And so what started out of fear and I woke up to this idea that made me really mad that it wasn't me. Nobody understood this. People were getting checks whether it was football or whatever job you were going into and not understanding, the passion began to grow of, well, I want to go empower this. I see the void. I see this thing I want to do is something that people need. And I intertwined that with a skill I consider myself good at, which is storytelling, which is taking these concepts that are you typically dry or harder to understand and making them digestible and actionable to the masses. I went into wealth advisory for about five years, wealth management, and I woke up to the reality like I I love what wealth managers do. I think it's very important, but I don't want to spend the rest of my life dealing with the one percenters. I want to deal with the 80 percent. Like I want to deal with the, the large subset of people who I can see a significant impact and change on. It was interesting stages for me through the fear and the awakening, getting my CFP while I was playing. But no, there was no real opportunity for me while playing because I hit it. I didn't let anybody know I was studying for the CFP because I don't want people to think I had an off ramp or a second option that would question my integrity. And then once I was done, I went and worked as an advisor and built up from that grounds. And so it's people look at me and are like, oh, well, you know, it must have been easy being a football player doing money. And it's just the opposite. Once you leave the game, there's a sense of it turning on you. And now those people that thought you were a little higher mighty or whatever, they want to knock you down. And so you deal with the stereotype jock mentality far beyond your playing days. And so it's been it's been a long road and one that I've enjoyed and I've had as many setbacks and failures as anyone. But it is this passion, this idea that I want to go and empower a million people and It wasn't until somebody said that to me, and it wasn't until very recently that I've had multiple people say, I need to add a couple zeros to that, that has really interested me that I'm headed down a path that I could have never envisioned five years ago because this industry wasn't truly developed and created. And now I'm going to be one of the people that pioneer it and be able to facilitate this language to every company in the United States because this virus, this crisis is going to awaken people to a financial wellness reality. Jed, this is definitely not a story that we often get, you know, in this kind of space, in the financial independence space. We thank you for giving us a look behind the curtain into the NFL and what that looks like. And for people who want to follow along with all this work you're doing and maybe even get in contact with you, like where is the best place for them if they didn't get enough of your story in this hour podcast? Well, I love feedback. I love connecting with people. The first book was written based on 10 frequently asked questions and misunderstood concepts. The second book is based on just the next 10 steps that I've gotten. So you can connect to me on social media, LinkedIn, Twitter. I told you guys before the show, I'm on Instagram now, like I'm trying. And I also have my website, JedediahCollins.com. By all means, get the book and let me know what you think. It's a growing process and this is not the end of my world. Sweet, man. Well, we'll definitely have all that good stuff linked up in the show notes so our listeners don't have to remember the names and the handles and all that good stuff. But one thing we'd like to ask all of our guests is what is your number one tip for those, if you could just boil it down to one tip for those on the path to financial independence? So again, I'm planner mindset. And so I look at one of the most strategic vehicles you can use as a young professional, as a young earner, Chapter 10 in the book is around what is my best advantage today, and it's the introduction to the Roth vehicle, Roth IRAs, Roth 401ks. Number one, you're going to be taxed in a lower income tax bracket because you're just starting out in your career. Number two, you're going to get 50 plus years of tax-free growth, which is a mindset shift that a lot of people need to start understanding is we're going to live into our 90s, and some of us are going to see hundreds plus You need to be able to strategize that far in advance. That is overwhelming and too complex for this moment. But just understanding that a vehicle like a Roth account 
will give you a strategic advantage because you can pull those dollars out if and when you need to use them. And it is just one of those ideas and concepts that is relatively new. 20 years ago, people weren't using these types of accounts. And I think if we can go and open a million Roth accounts throughout America because young professionals see the advantage and strategy and are starting to play chess with their money vehicle, then we're headed in a good direction. Awesome. Love that. Well, we've almost got you out of here, Jed, but we do have one last question, and that is the wild card question. As you could tell, me and Cody weren't sure who was going to ask you, so we obviously don't prepare for this. So are you ready for it? I think as ready as I'll ever be. Well, this is a financial podcast, and I couldn't help but ask. I think everyone's always curious, like, can you give us any crazy stories of people just absolutely buying the most ridiculous stuff that you've ever seen, like blowing money in just a almost a strange way? I mean, $50,000 on the guy's first Christmas was heartbreakingly sweet. There is a famous story of Vince Young buying up an entire Southwest Airlines flight because he wanted to see what it'd feel like to be the only person on it. <laughs> um, you know, you see like guys who get like souped up minivans and put in like $120,000 into, you know, like a, a minivan with seven different TVs in it. You're just like, what? What? <laughs> uh, but brother, it's, it's every day you look as far as the wives and just look at it and you're like, she is literally wearing $28,000 every time she leaves the door. And it's just a really tough competitive space. I think one of the silver linings of what we're going through is nobody's keeping up with the Joneses right now. You don't see the Joneses. You don't feel the Joneses. In the NFL, in the competitive environment, it is. If you buy one, I not only want to get one, but I want to get the next one or a little bit bigger one. And I have pictures of guys' cars because one dude got a Hummer. The next guy got the H2. The next guy got whatever the heck was the biggest thing. And they, they just kept growing and growing. And you look at the parking lot and you're like, this is a psychological experiment in and of itself. All right. So my key takeaway is now that the Joneses don't exist, you don't have to keep up with them. And Jed, <laughs> just want to thank you again, man, for coming on today. You could have been doing anything. You could have been watching the Tiger King. You could have been working on all these different entrepreneurial ventures you go going on. But you chose to come and hang out with us and share your awesome story and message with our audience. So thank you so much for coming on today. Hey, brother, the beauty and the curse of having a message is you go and offer it to your audience. And you guys are doing exactly what I want to share with, who I want to share with. So thank you both for the platform, for your time. I've enjoyed it. I appreciate like-minded people. So kudos to you. And yeah, I hope nothing but positive comes from this. man, Justin, I was so excited when we got Jed to agree to come on the Fi Show. It's such an honor to have him on and share some of his knowledge and expertise. Definitely a different episode from ones we've done before, and I really loved it. How about you, man? Yeah, I really enjoyed this episode. I mean, obviously, I'm a huge fan of the NFL and just football in general, so it's cool from that aspect. But he also had a really cool story, and I love that he just started right from the front talking about some money mistakes that he had. Even though he was an accounting major, you know, he said, hey, I didn't really have personal finance understood and he talks about how he spent his first paycheck before he ever even opened up the check. And it just kind of started him realizing like, whoa, I have no idea what I'm doing. And this is scary. Another thing that I really liked was he really broke it down into the numbers because it sounds so crazy when we say, OK, this 23, 24 year old is making a million dollars a year. But when you break down the million dollars a year after taxes, after living that lavish lifestyle, he was saying there's some dinners where you're spending tens of thousands of dollars in one night. Once you break that down for just the average player, of course, we're kind of in a different space here where we understand the compound interest and the future value of money. But people don't get taught that, that are going to these sports and making all this money right off the bat. So I thought it was really interesting for him to break it down. Like, yeah, you have that big ticket price, like, ooh, a million dollars. But once you kind of boil it down to what these players actually spend it on and what they actually keep in their pocket, it's something like, you know, fifty or $100,000. And then that quickly gets blown the year after. Another angle that I thought was interesting was we always think about these rookies and NFL players coming in and wasting their money on cars and jewelry, which is definitely a thing that happens. But he also highlighted how a lot of people find themselves being the only person in their family who's made it, who's making any money. It may be a poor neighborhood. It may be like a completely different impoverished country. And they're trying to support 
you know, maybe 10 family members with their paycheck and they're trying to be really nice about it, but they, it's kind of like the oxygen mask on an airplane, right? Where you need to give yourself oxygen first. These players end up overextending themselves and getting themselves in a bad position where not only can they not take care of their family, but they can't even take care of themselves. One thing that really resonated with me from Jed's story is just his whole mindset around failure and always getting back up. I know he said when he'd go into rooms, he'd say, hey, how many times do you guys think I got cut? They'd be like, oh, four or five. He's like, no, 13 times. And you know what? I'm not here because I never got cut and I'm the best player ever. I'm here because I never failed to get back up. And I just think that's such a powerful mindset for people to have. Obviously, most people listening to this podcast are never going to be in the NFL, but these same lessons can translate over into business. They can translate over into relationships. They can translate over into so many different facets of your life. So if you kind of have that nobody can get me down forever mentality, you're going to be in such a more advantageous position in any aspect of your life. Now, obviously, we spent a lot of time here talking about Jed's NFL career because that's just such a cool angle. But he's, he's doing a really great job actually going out there and teaching personal finance, not just to these rookies in the NFL, but to people all over through public speaking and his book, Your Money Vehicle. And he's got these five associations of money that I thought was a cool way to break it down. And he's just like, hey, if you just automate your money, because it's going to fall into one of these five categories, then you can take a lot of the guesswork out of it. You can stop stressing about it and you can just be on a good path. And those five buckets were what he calls society, which is like your taxes, past decisions, so things you're already locked into like rent, a cell phone bill, present day actions, like if you decide to stop, get Starbucks on the way home, future choices, so how you're investing, saving, things like that, and then compassion, which would be like donations, giving, charities, things like that. So you get that all set up where you've got those five categories, you know where your money's going across those five, you can stop stressing, and you've got that routine that you can stick in, the same way that a lot of professional athletes find themselves in, just routines leading to success. And now it's time for the call to action. And so the call to action today is to break your money into those five associations of money. So start to think about your past, your future, your present, all the things that affect your money and how you can change them to be in a more advantageous position. If you enjoyed the show and you want to read through all the show notes, get the links to his website and to his book, you can do all of that over at thefyshow.com slash Jed. That's thefyshow.com slash Jed. And as always, if you want to check out our Facebook group page, you can do so at thefyshow.com slash community. And we always appreciate those five-star reviews. They help us get great guests like we had today. And if you're interested in supporting The Fi Show, you can do so by checking out some of our partners over at the resources page, which can be found at thefyshow.com slash resources. And thanks for listening. 